Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the From Adversity to Abundance podcast. I am your host, Jamie Bateman, and today I'm thrilled to have with us Corey Peterson of Kahuna Investments. Uh, Corey, how are you doing today? Man, I'm doing well. Thank you, Jamie, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. We really appreciate you taking the time. I know you've uh, we're going to talk about time here, I think, uh, on this one, uh, but t- time is obviously a very valuable resource for all of us, so we appreciate you taking taking your time to impart some wisdom on us. Um, tell us, you know, who you are today and, and what you're up to with your business and, um, you know, why, why we sh- should listen to you. Well, um, I don't know why you should listen to me, but uh, <laughs> I think I, I know a couple of things about failing, um, adversity. Um, and um, really getting kicked in the nuts, um, and but able to survive and persevere. I think the entrepreneur creed is like, the sooner you learn how to fail uh, and fail faster, the actually faster you'll succeed. So uh, today I am a multifamily operator. Uh, I think I own like $230 million worth of commercial real estate across the United States. Uh, we're vertically integrated. I mean, we have our own management company. We self-manage our our assets. We have got about, I don't know, 40 employees on that side of uh, the ball. And, um, but I love real estate. I love what it does. And, um, but it, it wasn't always perfect. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, truly I'm living my best life. I enjoy what I do. I speak, I teach, I coach and run a mastermind. So we kind of do it a little bit of all, but um, mainly um, my proudest thing that I am is it has nothing to do with real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more about, uh, my proudest achievement is I feel like I've been a full-time dad. That's awesome. Right? And a, and a good husband to my wife. Most well, of the I time. know, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I've got kids and, and a wife and, uh, the, it's, it can be, and I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a real estate investor. And, you know, I know a lot of our listeners can relate to what you're saying. So it can be challenging to do all of the above, at least well, um, so I think we're going to, we're going to dive into that in a little bit here. Um, so what, just before we jump into your backstory, what does kind of a, what does a typical week look like for you? Uh, I start my day at nine. So I usually wake up at five, right? So, uh, I wake up at five, go to the gym at six. Um, I get off at four uh, ish, right? I work Monday through Thursday. I take Fridays off. Um, I calendar all my vacations. I calendar any of my kids events. Um, you know, basically I, we take three to four really good vacations a year. Um, sometimes a little bit more if we want to, but we just live, I just live by a calendar, right? I've learned that that's the most successful tool. I love working. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love what I do. I love coming into work. Mm -hmm. I love my team. I love playing the game and I'll probably do it till I die. But, um, Truly, mm-hmm. at this point, I'm really uh, in the C-suite. I'm the CEO of my company. And my primary job is I, I control uh, people, culture, and um, uh, numbers. Okay. I kind of need to know my numbers for my business. Sure. But uh, but I find that my, my favorite thing to do is the culture piece, right? Hmm. If I create award-winning culture within my company... Um, I retain some of the best and top and brightest talent. Mm-hmm. They want to stay for long periods of time and they do amazing work. That's usually not just one plus one. It's usually one plus five or one plus 10, right? It's a 10 X factor. Sure. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, I love to talk more about, you know, how you're able to, how you were able to set up this, this, you know, life that you're living and we're going to get into that. Um, so let's jump into your backstory. I know before we hit record, you shared a little bit with me as far as some of the, the pain that you've been through and, 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 you know, maybe some of the mistakes you've made, um, let's jump into, to your backstory and some of the adversity you've gone through. Well, I would like to say it's really almost, it's been almost 22 years ago. That's when my life changed forever. That's when the fork in the road appeared. But uh, I was with my girlfriend, now my wife of 20 years, and my mom was married to a man called Bruce. Um, I like to call call him Bruce Wayne. (laughs) He wasn't Batman, but (laughs) Jamie, he was loaded. He had lots of money. Okay. And so uh, we got this offer. My mom's like, hey, hon, son, uh, do you want to go to Hawaii? And I was like, uh, well, yeah, uh, <laughs> right. but I'm broke because I was a used car salesman. 
And uh, and I was we had this girlfriend, and so I was like, "Are you paying, mom?" And she said, "Yeah, I'll pay." Well, nice. um, we get to Hawaii, and uh, and I really never really met Bruce. I, I knew she was married to him, um, mm-hmm. but uh, Bruce had a house right on the beach, <clears throat> and I'm telling you, it was it was in Kauai, the Garden Island. I'm not sure if you know the islands, but Kauai, in my opinion, is the most beautiful. Okay. And um, it was on a cove. And so uh, if you're not a morning person, you will be when you get to Hawaii, right? <laughs> Shelly and I walked this cove and uh, we watched the sun come up. And it was like the scales of life fell off my eyes. Like I'd always wanted to be successful, but here I was a used car salesman, just not doing what I planned in life. And, um, but I wanted it really bad. I remember looking over at Bruce's house and I was like, Dude, this guy is different because it was the first time, Jimmy, that I saw real wealth. Like Bruce unequivocally had time and money. Like his phone wasn't ringing. He didn't have any cares. I was like, dude, I've never seen it like this. So yeah. I was like, what do you do? <clears throat> and then he said the magic words. He said he was in real estate. They owned apartments. <laughs> there right? you go. Now, I wish the story got better, but it doesn't. Bruce was a grumpy old man. Uh, okay. My mom was really pretty, so don't judge my mom. She did get me to <laughs> Hawaii. Um, but uh, but I left that island thinking that Bruce was the big kahuna. Like, sure. he had a lifestyle. Uh, so I read that Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, and all of a sudden I was like, dude, that's what it is. I want to do real estate. So um, I fell in love with, with real estate at that moment, and that's when I really got the download from the mothership. Like, this was my life. This is what I'm supposed to do. Mm-hmm. So when you turn that, qu- so at that point, then I'm, you know, I go crazy. I'm starting to read all the books I can on real estate. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. just a book nerd. Finally mm-hmm. get to the point where I'm I'm ready to start my company. I'm like, what do I name it? And all I could think about is I wanted to be the big kahuna. So I named my company called Kahuna mm-hmm. Investments, yeah. right? And so, the, but that's when the real work started happening. And at the at point, I was a wholesaler. I was uh, going to these RIA events, Real Estate Investors Associations, Mm -hmm. and I would sit by smart people, the guys that had money, and I would figure out what they're doing and, you know, where they buy, what is their average rehab, and I would go and I'd find deals like that and wholesale them, and um, that was working pretty well. I was like, oh, wow, I'm I'm, now I'm in real estate, and this happened, I really went about full time, about 2009. And that's when the Great Recession happened. So it was a great time to be in real estate. I'm finding these deals. Um, And so then uh, the next magic piece was someone gave me their actual money, right? I raised my first piece of private money. And I equate that moment to like going into a telephone booth as Clark Kent. And I spun around that thing and I was like Superman, right? (laughs) And so this guy gave me $85,000 to do a fix and flip. And once I got that, I was like, man, this is awesome. Because, you know, it takes money to make money. Sure. But it yeah. doesn't always take your money. That's Absolutely. what I learned, right? It can be other, other people's money. So once I understood that, I, um, I'm, I'm really not that smart, Jamie, but I am a fantastic copier. Like, I can copy like nobody's yeah. business. <laughs> yeah. So I looked around and said, there's got to be some other people that's raising money that, you know, and what do they use? What's their tools? What are they saying? What are they not saying? And I became, I found a a mentor. And um, next thing I know, I go, I'm raised, I, uh, within a year, I have about a $3 million that I'm working. Now, this is going to lead to my, the next, the real setup. Mm -hmm. So here I am being the jack of all trades and to the world's eyes, right? I am now two years in, like really, I started my company in 2005, but 2009 is when I went full time. By 2010, I'm jamming, bro. Like I'm doing seven or eight deals, fix and flips a month. I'm making 20 to $30,000 a flip. Wow. Um, my life looks, I'm looking pretty successful. I'm sure. feeling successful, Right. Sure. But there's some things that are not so good going on. And these are the things that hopefully you, your audience will, will think about. Because at that moment in time, we're into the world's view. I was great. But sure. dude, I, this phone was tied to my, my ear. I could not escape it. 
I was a slave to it. And I was a slave to working at all times of the day, at all times of the night, Mondays through Sunday, right? Like I was, I was just a workaholic mm -hmm. Got it. to make this almighty dollar. So now let me just jump in. You, uh, now we'll, we'll just, uh, figure out how old you are now. <laughs> so in 2010, approximately how old were you at this, at that point? 30. Yeah. 30. Okay. Well, uh, uh, yeah, around 30. Got it. So you'd been a used car salesman then, yeah. um, in your, I guess, mid thirties, right. You switched, yep. you were kind of gravitating and slowly moving into real estate and then you full-time, um, 2009, 2009. So, um, 2930, you go full-time into real estate and then you start off wholesaling and, and flipping ran out of your own cash in order to scale, which is a you know common, common issue, right? You need access to capital, start, start seeing the, the light bulb moments are happening where you're seeing, you can use other people's money to, to scale your business. Um, and, but, but you're a workaholic. Um, and so you, from the outside, you look super successful, super busy. This guy's crushing it. This guy's a genius. I want this life of, you know, I want to be Corey Peterson. Maybe somebody was thinking on the outside, um, but tell us about what was going on in, in, in the family. And, and yeah, um, cause inside the home life, I was a wreck, right? My wife's like, gosh, damn, can you not just get off the phone for a minute? Look at me. What about me? What about your kids? Right. And <clears throat> this was like a two year period where, you know, you got to understand when you, when you, I grew up poor, right. And mm -hmm. I desperately wanted to get out of poor. Sure. And, and that was my driving force. And I thought that, you know, I was saying things like, well, I'm doing it for my kids. Sure. I'm doing it for my family. Yeah. That's a lie, right? I was doing it for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there was an expense, a price to pay for doing it the way that I was doing it because there was no, no balance. I didn't mm -hmm. create any things that gave me uh, time freedom or, or really any freedom. It was just work, 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 go, 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 go. Right. And my yeah. only thought was this will not last. Right. I've I'm, I don't care. This will take care of us. But as I started to realize like, so, but then something changed. So here's what happened. I I'm, I'm, I was still active in my kid's life, but like, let's just say, you know, it's not, wasn't perfect dad. Right. Mm -hmm. And sure. you know, this is, at a, a pivotal time in your kid's life where like, you know, around seven and eight, they're really wanting and needing you. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, and you want to be their coaches and, and you, you know, that was, my dad was my coach. Right. So, um, you know, but there was a time where my son was playing soccer and he was like, Hey dad, you're going to be at my game on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I look at him like, yeah, no problem. son. I'll be there. Right. And I was like, his game was like three o'clock. But in my mind, I was like, dude, Saturday, I got I got to go look at these three properties because I didn't look at these rehabs and didn't touch base to see where they're at. So mm -hmm. I was like, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'll just wake up early in the morning. I'll go all to these three properties and I'll get back in time for the game. Okay. Sure. Jamie, you know, you go to the first property and there's problems. Like, oh gosh, I got to run to Lowe's, got to get stuff. I'm like looking at my clock. Oh gosh, I'm, I'm feeling like a little getting tight. Go to the yeah. second property. Now I'm getting like, by the third property, I'm like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm gonna miss. I get there, I show up to the uh game at mm -hmm. at the end of the game. And dude, my son comes off the field crying. And I'm just telling you, dude, if you've ever been broke as a as a as a parent, mm -hmm. uh when you're uh this one's tough to tell, but like yeah. when you yeah, go no, in, yeah, um, my <laughs> he's like, Dad, you promised. Oh, promise man. and he just starts and i i remember taking his head and put it in my chest and he's like <laughs> like wow. that horrible sure. cry as a as a kid and i'm just like and i'm just taking him in and, and he's just sobbing because it meant so much and i wasn't there right and i'm just telling you jamie that moment broke me so true mm. um i knew i <laughs> i was like what in the hell am I doing? Sure. Right. Yeah. Like what is, because yeah. if, 
is horrible, right? Yeah, no, and and I and just I'll just say I appreciate you being vulnerable, and you know, uh, I mentioned before we hit record, it's you know, it's unfortunately a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of fathers can relate to this this story. Maybe not exactly how it played out in your case, and maybe maybe there were times they should have actually felt <laughs> what you felt, but um, the point is that it's very easy. You know, I own a small business, a few small businesses, and it's very easy to just, I I love it. Like you said, I love building a team. I love, you know, generating income. I love real estate investing. Um, doesn't mean I, I don't love my family, but it's very easy to get sucked into working all the time. And, um, and, and you do tell yourself you're doing it for them. And maybe, you know, there is some truth to that as well. I mean, um, but so... What did you do? I mean, it, it sounds like this well, really this really broke you. Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, it's funny. Uh, so kids are resilient. It's crazy. Um, sure. Even though I'm breaking his heart, he's like, he goes home with me, wants to go in my truck. Right. <laughs> so the whole way to ride home is like he's on this side. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm just I'm dying inside, man. I'm like, oh, my God, my little boy. I'm breaking his it's just it hurt him bad. And so. I get home, drop him off. And my wife looks at me. She's like, you got to fix this. You got to solve it. Like, this is bull crap, right? This yeah. is what you've been doing, right? And so I I get in my truck and I just start, I drive, I drive by myself, man. And I'm telling mm -hmm. you, when I'm in that truck by myself, mm -hmm. I am cussing myself out <laughs> so bad. What the F, you stupid SOB. Like, mm -hmm. why would you do this? Why would you think you need to go look at these properties? Why couldn't you just go to the damn game, right? Sure. And I mean, just beating myself up. And finally, I I surrender my heart to God. And I was, I asked, I asked God to forgive me, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I found solitude. And I find, so I got into a place of quiet, right? And then that's what happened. Then it changed my life because hmm. I drove by um, the street that I go on. There was this apartment complex and I've driven by it a million times, my friend. Mm -hmm. And I used to say, I wish I could own an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. And I drive by this apartment complex and I look at it empty, just broken and empty. And I go, how can I own an apartment complex? I framed it differently. You framed it differently. Sure. Yeah, my brain starts working. I flash back to Bruce. Yeah, two thousand and four, cash flow, time and yeah. money. He said yeah. apartments. He didn't say fix and flip. Right, right, right. absolutely. And yeah. I was like, oh my god, that's it. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. I flipped around. I did a U turn. I went to Barnes and Nobles. I bought every yeah. book I could on multifamily investing. Nice. I found a mentor, um, and now I'm living my cash flow life. Right, that's awesome. And yeah. you know, I did go and and um, I did some specific things too. Really, my takeaways from that was I started to time block right, and I can't remember who I learned this from, but like, you know, the first thing we did, and me and my wife was like, "Listen, we I don't want to be that person." Yeah. So let's figure it out, right? So the first thing we did is we booked our family vacations. Yeah. All right. You know, honey, when the, the kids do sports now, I, I, I actually said, I want to be their coach. So I get, I was like, I'm going to start coaching. I want to, I'm going to get involved. Like I was, I'm like, I'm not going to be the, the dad that did not. Sure. I can do it if I will just make time for it. Right. Right. You make it a priority. I mean, you, yep. exactly. Other things are going to take a backseat. So my you... daughter is playing soccer, you know, like, so I coach my son's football, I coach my daughter's soccer, and yeah. looking back, probably the best four to five, six year span of my life that I'm the most proud of was being on that soccer field or that football field when the sun's going down and we have amazing sunsets in Arizona and being sure. there watching these young kids and seeing your kid and knowing that you're mm -hmm. the dad that's there. Yeah. One of the best feelings ever. So that's, I get to say that I was, even though I had a little spot where I screwed up royally. Sure. I fixed it and I, and I became a full-time dad, like truly yeah. <clears throat> the dad that I wanted to be right. to my kids. Right. Sure. Cause no, they I, don't I, trade in money by the, by the yeah. way, no right. kid ever worries about how much money dad makes. 
The only currency they trade in is time. That's a great point. That's a great point. I've not heard it put that way. Um, you know, so yeah. And for, for the listener out there who may be, may be dabbling in real estate or, you know, under learning about different asset classes and things. I know a lot of, a lot of newer real estate investors in air quotes, get into wholesaling and, and in fix and flips, um, because they think they're in, you, you alluded to it earlier. You said you were in real estate, right? Yeah. You were in real estate, but you basically had a, you just had a job. I mean, it's, uh, you're, and flips. you're, you're a not, trader. Yeah, exactly. With a D. <laughs> right. It, it's transactional and that it's a lot of work. I don't personally think it's the worst way wholesaling or fix and flipping. I think it can be a great way to generate income. It's a know. great way. It's what you do with that income that I've learned now. That's what I teach is sure. that it's, it's taking that money and creative passive and passive income is the true way to have freedom. Absolutely. Right? And so that, um, that that's my mantra is like, do whatever you're doing in your, like I have a lot of business owners that, um, they have very successful businesses they run, you know, HVACs, what you name it. Um, and then they take their money that they make from their business and they invest it in a passive type yep. of either with me or they do their own investments as well absolutely. to create their their getaway car, Yeah, right? Absolutely. Uh, I'm in a mastermind group. It's called the Passive Income Mastermind. And you can debate all day long about, you know, we love to put things into to make them black and white. It's either passive or it's not. Well, there's really kind of a lot of gray in between in my in my opinion. But I completely agree with you. Generate income based you know from your business or your or your your W two if that's you know if you if you can and then put that into passive income a passive income you know generating assets. I love it. Um, so you know, talk us through kind of I I know from the point where you saw the apartment building and realized how and you changed your perspective. You framed it differently. You said, how can I own that? Um, talk us from that point up through today. I know that's a ton yeah. of growth and a lot of, you know, ups and yeah. downs and everything, but walk us through that from an entrepreneurial perspective. From the entrepreneurial side, it was like, okay, so that was my new task. Okay. So I knew that fix and flip wasn't the model for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then I, so the, again, what I've learned is I'm not that smart, but I'm an excellent, excellent copier. So I had to find a mentor for me. So I found uh, a guy named David Lindahl. I read one of his books. Mm -hmm. and I, I resonate with him. So I found him out. He's out of Boston, Massachusetts. Flew out there, um, gave him some money, became a friend. Mm -hmm. And he taught me everything that I know, right? And so I, and then, you know, then you just got to do the work. So then I'm like, sure. okay, well, I got to find a deal. So, you know, uh, underwrote a lot of deals. And a lot of them don't work, but then one did. And that one that did, I was able to take the money that I was already raising for the single family side mm -hmm. and transition it and say, hey, listen, we're just going to move into this this arena. Sure. And so we raised, we bought our first deal for $3.2 million. And we raised, well, $1.4 million of uh, private money. Okay. Right? Yeah. So that was my first deal. And, and even that one went sideways, Jamie. Mm, right. Okay. A little bit. Right. So I made a couple of key mistakes. So I didn't actually find the deal. I had partners that people that I knew, mm. I kind of knew, we'll call it, I kind of knew <laughs> they had a deal and they didn't have all the money that they needed to do the deal. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I had money, even though it wasn't my money, I knew I could command it. Sure. Right. Okay. So we struck a deal where it was supposed to be, you know, 75, 25 split. I was going to own the 75. I was going to bring in my capital. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so we bought this deal for 3.2 million. Right. So, but in, when we closed, somehow mm -hmm. they changed the operating agreement and I didn't catch it, nor my attorney where I did have a 75, 25% of the ownership of the income, but on mm -hmm. the voting rights, it was 33, 33 33. Oh, wow. There was three guys, right? Me and two other guys. Yeah. All of a sudden, I didn't have control. Hmm. And the other two guys were knew each other very well, it sounds like, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, so that was, I'm like, okay, I just took all these people's money. I right. told them I had control. Now I don't have control. So what do you do? Well, I'm not proud of this moment. <laughs> <laughs> I may have picked up the phone call and I did a, <laughs> a you know, a, 
you know, I'm coming and hell's coming with me kind of call. <laughs> I'm going to be on your front doorstep uh, tomorrow and we're going to figure it out. Right. Aaron so Chapman pop- drove over in his Jeep and uh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we were going to go. At, I basically said, listen to this one guy. It's like your, your, your PO, your POS, what you did was wrong. You know, you deceived it. Sure. Right. Sure. And, uh, but I'm coming and I'm, we're going to come to an agreement on price and I'm buying your shares. Okay. Right. Gotcha. Sure. Now I didn't have any extra money at this time. So, but what I did have is I was resourceful and I knew I had investors that would give me money. Right. So it was more yeah. than what I expected. But so uh, for at, at the end of the day, it was 200 K boom, buy that guy out. Right. So I, I, I paid him 200 K. I had to call the guys like, Hey, why are we 200 K <laughs> made the, made the move, got the shares. I like, okay, now I'm back in control. Then my next problem happens. Uh, they had got us in a loan that was called uh, that's um, uh, was called a lockbox. It's a full lockbox, meaning all the money goes into the bank that's uh, account that's controlled by the bank, and the bank only will release the funds for expenses. Got it. Ooh. Well, I'd already promised my investors I'm paying them along the way. Sure. Uh oh, we don't <laughs> have money to pay investors. Yeah. What do I do? Call another guy. Hey, listen, I need, <laughs> I need another couple hundred thousand dollars for this deal, right? I put it in, you know, my own bank account and and, and parlayed that money, and it was paying from that. Um, now, so each of the steps of the way, I'm like, I'm learning, like, know thy operating agreement, know <laughs> sure. thy business partner. Um, those little words matter, right? All those things really truly matter, and then, um, but. The one thing that I did right, Jamie, is I really underwrote the heck out of that deal. I understood what that deal needed and I understood what it could do. Nice. And so we ended up keeping it for five years and um, we sold it for 8.8 million bucks. So we bought it for 3.2 and sold it for 8.8 million bucks, right? Wow. How, mu- how much so, did you put it put into it? Do you, uh, zero, do you zero of my money, right? <laughs> Just 1.4 million of someone else's. Right. So I yeah. ended up making a uh, $2 million profit. Wow. That's awesome. Now, that just first as far as how were you, you know, and I have some guesses, but tell the listener out there how you were able to just pick up the phone and, and, you know, receive 200 K for example, how did you have those connections well, or how I had you- planted the seed when I was doing my fix and flip business, right? Those are a lot sure. of my investors that I had worked with that give me money time and, you know, and I give it back to them to give me money. So I built a little bit of a relationship with them, right? Sure. Now, <clears throat> that is my skill set. So the one thing, the difference between what I do <clears throat> now and I think what the difference in the separator for the people that are in mm-hmm. multifamily mm-hmm. is the one skill set I mastered was how to raise capital. Mm-hmm. So I, instead of learning how to find a deal or how to be a great operator, which I've, I, we, we're both like, we we're, sure. have our own management company as well, but- the skill set that I hold high above all others mm-hmm. and that pays me the most money was learning how to raise capital. Now I didn't say this earlier, but like I was a used car salesman, but um, I had a good friend that said, uh, Hey man, you need to become a financial advisor. <laughs> and I was like, well, don't you need to have a degree to do that? He <laughs> goes, no, you just got to uh, kind of like be an entrepreneur. I was like, Oh, well I started this real estate company business Maybe I that was early like 2004, right? So I was like, maybe uh, I can use that. So I I did uh, trade up from the car salesman sure. to a financial advisor. It's yeah. still slimy either way. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but I think it is. Uh, but that company a, taught me all about money. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I think that, and I've I've mentioned this on once or twice previously on other episodes, but I think that's a key piece for the listener out there as far as. You may not love the position that you're in right now. I'm not saying don't think about starting a business or don't think about switching careers, but do the best you can at the in the position you're in and learn what you can from that role. Put and, and you never know where it's where you're going to be able to apply it later because that's that's what happened to you, right? Jamie, Corey? I'm doing this right now in my my management company. So <clears throat> we just started this management company like two weeks ago. So nice. But something that I learned almost 18 years ago when I was a restaurant manager, <laughs> right? 
is they had, when I was managing a restaurant, they had what's called, when I first came on, I was the MIT, a manager in training. Mm -hmm. And every location paid a little bit of money to the collective, to the home office for Mm -hmm. the MIT program. Okay. And that allowed them to have a training hub or training dollars Mm -hmm. to keep people in the system. Because as they try to grow and operate or people come and go, you want to have, People that are already knows your system, knows the process, knows that already are bleeding your brand, mm-hmm. right? Sure. And so um, I'm doing that with my management company. So we have an mm-hmm. MIT program mm-hmm. where we are now teaching these property managers. We have them go sit with the maintenance. Then we have to go with the uh, you know community ambassador, then to the leasing, to the then to the property manager. We get them all certified. These are young college kids because we have college properties and they're deployable. Mm-hmm. So they're like, when I get a new location, they're ready. And then they're bleeding kahuna. They already know our warrior cry. That's awesome. And so I get a much, much better product. So that's a great yeah. example of yeah. I didn't like being a property manager. Right, right. But I you learned some know. valuable lessons. Right. And and as you said already a couple of times, you're a very good copier, right? You you didn't actually come up with this idea that you're that you're implementing now. Um you know, I'm not taking anything away from you, but I, I love it. It's like, why, why reinvent the wheel if you've seen it, if you've seen success before, which is really, really gets to the kind of the the point of this podcast is we're trying to learn from you. You've been through some hard times and, and you've been, you've reached abundance and we're not saying you don't have any more challenges in your life or anything like that, but why can't the listener learn from you, Corey Peterson, as to learn from what you learned about the, you know, the MIT program or, you know, and, and some keys to success there. So, so, you know, I guess what, what is your, you already touched on it, but what does your business look like today? And maybe one or two kind of broad brush lessons learned as far as scaling a business. Um, what could you, uh, uh yeah. how could you help the listener there? I would tell you, um, hiring people as the CEO, um, or even if you're not this year, like you, but you know, a lot of times we put on a lot of hats, but as you start mm-hmm. to hire people, do not pass that off on anybody else. Right. I believe now, and I have a hiring process again, they called the four C's right. There's uh, you, if you're watching in the video right now, you're going to see mm-hmm. my four C's hiring process. Um, but I stole that from another book called, um, a CEO does three things by Trey Taylor. <laughs> Right. I, I really want to tell you, like, I am not smart, but I am an excellent <laughs> copier. And so he has this thing where it's culture, capabilities, compensation um, and commitment. Mm. And it's just a hiring process. And I follow it religiously mm-hmm. and like create your company. You have culture in your company, mm-hmm. um, whether you know it or not. And so it's either you're going to take uh, charge of that culture and mm-hmm. breathe life into it, or it'll do its own thing. Hmm. And so for me, the biggest component in any business is your people. That's so huge. don't like take that lightly, embrace it, but breathe life into it. And when you do that, magic always seems to happen. Hmm. At least that's, it has for me. That's fantastic advice. Um, so you still are heavily involved personally in, in, all the hiring in inside your companies will always be heavily like I will always do it. It's my favorite part, right? (laughs) It really is because I get to tell about my, like the story that I just told, I tell that on every first hire, like we've, the culture piece is telling you learn, you learn to, so here's a great thing. So any great company has a story there, the foundation story, develop yours, right? So I can put mine in very, articulate ways of mm-hmm. i tell it like bruce wayne right i make some funnies mm-hmm. out of it right mm-hmm. um but it's such a compelling story that it was like people gravitate towards that sure and then you put um some words and meanings behind your culture and what it really means so for us like we have we call it the like in the bible they have the beatitudes mm-hmm. um, we call yeah. ours the the kind attitudes which is hawaiian mm-hmm. word right and like be nice. the kind um you know give them um, spread aloha, right? Be Ohana. The Rock said in Lilo Stitch, your family, no one gets left behind. <laughs> and then there yeah. are our favorite ones, make it Mobetta. <laughs> nice. 
Yeah, I love it. It's awesome. It's really easy for people to, to kind of look at these companies, especially the bigger companies, you know, Apple or whatever, Microsoft, and yeah. and think that's not an that's not you know there are no people there. It doesn't have a story. It doesn't have a personality. It doesn't have any problems, you know, or challenges. It's just like a, a innate thing, you know. But that's not true for the the big businesses, and it's certainly not true for the small businesses. And so, yeah, I love it. It's, it's, there's such a human element to all of this, which again, gets to kind of the root of this show is just talking about the real challenges and the human element of, of overcoming adversity um, and getting to abundance. So I, I've got a few kind of rapid fire questions here and yeah. then we'll talk, then we'll talk a little bit more about your business today. Um, what's one thing that people misunderstand about you? Um. Uh- People that don't know me, they think that because I run a company that I'm all about money. Um, and it's the farthest thing from my life, right? So people that really know me understand this, but sometimes people look out because you have to, uh, our companies are, our business is supposed to make money. That's how we keep score. Sure. Um, and they think sometimes that um, I, that's just the misconception. Now, my business entrepreneur, people understand this, right? So, but people in sure. the world um, people that are working W2s will, they just don't understand us. Yeah. This is a rich, greedy guy. That's all about yeah. hoarding, hoarding money. But, question that's, uh, go ahead. Well, I just say I give away more money than I know. <laughs> right. And, and I help raise money for yeah. projects that are real passion projects. Right. So question that's, this isn't on my list, but you know, because I hear this sometimes because you, you were working really hard. You had a you were a workaholic and you were, your family was suffering from it. Um, and then you put in, you know, you, you put in uh, boundaries and you were intentional about your, your calendar and blocking time for your priorities. You reprioritized. My question really is, wouldn't that be easier? Let me put it this way. Isn't it easier now for you to set those boundaries and to be a better husband, better father, you know, than it was, you know, back in the day when you didn't have as much income, you didn't have as, as much uh, wealth, isn't it easier now? And wasn't it therefore required for you to work 80, 90 hours a week um, back then? What would you say to that? No, I don't think like once I made the change, right? So like, I think it's, it's more of a mental change. It has nothing to do with where you're at financially or not financially, in my opinion, right? Um, you could start this off wherever you're at and just say, okay, I need to be present, right? So like, I, there's some things you can do, like little things. Like one of the first things I do with my phone is after six o'clock, mm -hmm. it goes on do not disturb. Unless you're one of my favorites, <laughs> um, you yeah. can't get a hold of me, right? It will not ring. You have to call twice in a row for it to actually mm -hmm. ring on my phone. That's the great thing about technology is sure. that you can utilize it that way, right? And so, um, and then really the time blocking, once you, if you will train yourself to live and die by your calendar. Mm -hmm. What I find is most people are very um, horrible at time management. Sure. And things they could like, if you ever looked at someone going on a vacation, it's amazing what they get done in a week. Yeah. Everything magically happens and they get done. <laughs> right. 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 Because they prioritize it and they're not, they, there's no waste. Sure. We can do that in our business lives too, is you can actually accelerate everything you're doing in a day if you get really good and eliminate your waste or you're like, Oh, let me just check Facebook. Let me right, right. scroll and do a lot of dumb stuff. Yeah. You can be way more efficient. Yeah. Extremely more efficient. That's a great point. Yeah. So, so you can do those at now, no matter yeah. where you're at in your business. So you think you would have gotten to where you are today, even if you'd started time blocking and being uh, more intentional. I only early. wish I would have had someone show me that way yeah. back then. Right. Got because it. I would have been living even a better lifestyle. Like sure. um, I'm all about vision. You put your vision first yep. um, and then you build your life to work around it, your work life. And it has to fit in the cracks, right? So like if you put your family and the things you are, really believe are important and then you put your business on top, it has to fit in the cracks. That's great. I love that. If you could go back and have uh, if I'm sorry, if you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would you choose? Oh gosh. Um, honestly, this is, I, I wouldn't even do it with any historical, uh, I would do it with my grandpa. Okay. Tell, tell, <laughs> right? tell us why. Uh, 
because he was just a great man. He was just, I wish I could have, he was young when he died, right? He had Parkinson's, um, but he was just always there. I would just love to hear his stories a little bit more. He had a lot of wisdom. He he worked hard, but he, he, he was a farmer and um, farm life. There's something about farm life that I think is really um, inspiring to way the way he did it. Right. He, you know, he didn't have a huge farm, but he had probably 80 head of cattle and some chickens and some um, hogs. And um, I don't know. I just, I felt like he was my, a great picture of a man that had, that lived his life with purpose. Love it. It's great. Um, I know you have a, a book you've written at least one book. Um, we'll talk about it in a, in a second. If you had to write another book this year, what would it be about? Um, we we'll probably, we're actually working on it right now, Okay, <laughs> but, but this is, this is a book about, uh, it's more of a how to, it's really about the passive investor. So, um, just writing to our avatars saying, Hey, there's uh there's an alternative to the stock market. Right. Sure. And, um, you know, uh, there'll be my third book. Right. But, okay. uh, well, tell, tell but, us about the first two. The first one is uh, really uh, it's called why the rich get richer was my first one. And um, that was really a, a book on apartments, but it wasn't, it was, it wasn't well-written. I'll put it. It was my first book, right. It's like just mm-hmm. pulling out there. The one I'm most proud of, which is my hero's journey is the book. It's called copy your way to success, standing on the shoulder of giants. And you've heard me say the word copy a lot. Um, yeah. I wrote every word of this book, right? The first <laughs> one I was, I'd help. I had a, someone I interviewed me. They took my words. They made it into a story. This one I wrote over a two year period of time on the plane when I was flying when I was, when I had spare time and it goes, it's the, my hero's journey, right? It has that story of me, of the pain spot, right? Mm-hmm. And it really in detail fully explains my rags to riches uh, story. I think that's very inspiring. So that's why awesome. I like it the most because it's a very inspiring book of how I turned street smarts into uh, something that's made me a multimillionaire. It's fantastic. I, I got to get. And I, I'll give it to your. Uh, I'll give it to your audience. So there's a really easy way for them to get it. If they'll text the word book, B O O K, to four eight zero five hundred one one two seven. They'll just answer the prompts and we'll, uh, we'll send them one for free. 480-500-1127. Yep, text right? the word book. Yep. Text book. the word Got book. Got it. Awesome. What is one thing that you are one challenge in your business right now that you're struggling with or facing? There's always, a, you know, many, many challenges. What's one that comes to mind for you and your business right now? Um, people, it's always people like people yeah. is the most challenging and most fun. Right. So, um, mm-hmm. I feel like, um, how can I, how can I create a better culture? Um, how can I hire, um, how can I onboard people faster to get mm-hmm. it right to sink it? So that's what we've been really working on is like, how do we, you know, what's the recipe? Do we bring them to the home office? How do we create that environment where we get the mold that we're looking for? Right. Sure. Um, and I think that'll always be a work in progress for us, yeah. but, and we get it right really good, but it's still something that's always on my mind is how can I do it a little bit better? How can I improve upon the product and what do I need to be doing differently? Right. What, and, and a lot of times it's asking feedback, mm-hmm. right? Even the ones that say no, like if you didn't hire somebody, maybe mm-hmm. learning why they didn't want to go through your process, what was it? And then you ask, sometimes that's just the way it is. But sure. there's also some good exit feedback that mm-hmm. you can get. Or when people leave you, exit feedback, really trying to pay attention to that and saying, oh, boy, I didn't know that I was broken here. Sure. Right? Well, that's, yeah, it's, it can be humbling, but very <clears throat> valuable to to uh, gather that information. To I mean, and the only reason you're struggling, well, one reason you're you're struggling with it and you're focused on it, maybe you're not struggling with it, but you, there's always always challenges, is because it's so important, like you said earlier. I mean, if it wasn't, if hiring and people weren't the the backbone of your business, I don't think you would have answered <laughs> that. Yeah, way. no, no, because I say it. I mean, it's a challenge. I I I, I want to do it. Like right. I have this. Like 
in my mind, there's perfection, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's a level that we're running, which is good. I mean, which I think it's better per- than average, perfect. but sure. I, I feel like there's a chasm between like, I want to be award-winning, right? Mm-hmm. How do I create my, like, how do I create that? And I, I think, I'm, I feel like we're getting closer, but I really, that's my desire mm-hmm. is to have all my people like, dude, we're Kahuna, who are you? Mm-hmm. Right? And um, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm there yet. I may not ever mm-hmm. get there, but I'm going to keep mm-hmm. trying to improve. Um, if you were given $10 million tomorrow, just somebody cut your check for no, it's not an investment. It's just a, a gift. What would you do with it? <laughs> invest in real estate. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. There's nothing else. I mean, I would just invest in one, in, in another deal, right? I'd probably give, uh, well, I say that I'd probably give a lot to charity, right? So we, um, I'm in a group called uh, the Chandler Compadres here in uh, Chandler, Arizona. Okay. Um, we raise a lot of money for uh, youth, for the Boys and Girls Club here to our local chapter. Um, I think last year we raised $1.5 million for local charities. And um, it's very important to me. And so um, I would do that, probably give to my church. And then I'd take the rest of that money after I gave maybe 20% of it away um, and go go do some more real estate. Why not? Right. It's awesome. Yeah. I love it. So, um, tell us about kind of the, the multifamily space, you know, this year and what opportunities you have going on for, uh, for the passive investor and just kind of speak to the, the real estate and multifamily investing space, uh, today. Yeah. So, um, we're, we're on a pause, right? We're not buying anything right now. Um, probably not buying anything till maybe third quarter. Um, we still think the feds are going to raise rates a little bit more. Um, I, I don't have to buy. I'm not in a spot where I need to buy. So I'm just like, I'm mm-hmm. just being patient, right? I'd like to see a little bit more of the market get, um, there's a lot of trading still going on. There's a lot of transactions going on, mm-hmm. um, but we're just not ready to participate yet. I think we're going to wait till the third quarter. We've got a development project that we can green light whenever we want to. Um, that's on land that we already own on, a you know, just adding to more units to some of one of our existing properties. We'll probably do that at the end of the year for sure. And hopefully find maybe one more deal. Like that would be our 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 mantra for 2023. That's I think mm-hmm. that's probably what we'll do this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and really more hell bent focus on operations as we just took over our management company, mm. making sure we really dial in our SOPs for that company and just getting mm-hmm. it like machined. So about that acquisition, so that so- sounds like that was an operational company that you that you took over. Is that right? Well, we just created it. So we, okay. uh, we fired our third party management company because mm-hmm. they gotcha. suck. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'll really probably, I would say all property management that are fee based, they suck because they're fee based. We're not in alignment uh, on how it works, right? We're mm-hmm. profit and loss and they mm-hmm. can care less. They just want their fees. Sure. And so we finally got to a, a size that it, it really makes sense to, vertically integrated but the question was did we really want to do it and um we we'd wrestled with that for almost a year and mm-hmm. finally we just said it's time right and um i'm so glad that we did because i think that is the absolute right um choice and i know that it is now in my heart uh, our products can be better and really the story of even our company is it all makes sense right and so now we have more people, right, to bring in. And that's why it's, it's mm-hmm. that's part of what's part <laughs> that's of my why. challenge. We said about my right, challenge right. is yep. I've got to get these, all these new people that we just took over that are at our properties. Mm-hmm. They were, they were employees of my old management company. Uh huh. So now I've got to figure out how do I get them mm-hmm. onboarded to my culture yep. and my way as soon as possible. Yeah. That's a, that's, um, that's a lot of, so we're flying a... them out. Like we just like, huh. we gotta, we gotta get them integrated. We gotta go break bread with them. We got, we got to catch and sell the vision. Nice. So with regard to the more of the investment side, back to that, do you have, you're not under any pressure for, you know, I don't know, with like floating rate debt or bridge loans or anything to, any no, deals we, have, are... we still have some of those. Yeah, we have, we have, okay. we have those are other issues, but like uh, we have two <laughs> properties that are in bridge debt that are under what's called uh soft lockbox control because the interest okay. rates went high. Um, these deals are actually profitable, but, uh, and we have what's called rate, rate locks on them. So we're mm-hmm. getting paid a Delta for the rate lock, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. the, uh, but the property is not counting that as income. So 
we've fallen below mm -hmm. our debt coverage ratio. So um, we still have two more loans to place to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get that done in August um, because we had a prepayment penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, if we yeah. paid off early, we're not willing to pay that. So sure. we're patient. Um, our investors are, are really good and savvy. They understand mm -hmm. like we, we, from the very beginning, when we tell our investors, it's a marathon. It's not a yeah. sprint. Sure. That's really and, good to set, set the expectations like that. Yeah. Um, and so uh, what do you have open opportunities for investors now? Uh, we do, but you got to go through our process. So, like we couldn't offer them to anybody that's uh, in, you know, that's listening. Um, but mm -hmm. gotcha. we're, we're regulated Understood. by the SEC. We're under regulated by the SEC. Um, yeah. You can go to our website, Kahuna Investments, um, sure. and get through our process. Um, but we really have, there's some rules that we've got to follow. We got to get to know you. We have to have what's called sure. an accredited investor questionnaire filled out. Once yeah. we do that, we can show you future deals. Got it. Understood. Makes a lot of sense. Um, what have I not asked you that you'd like to talk about? Um, man, you've, you've done a really good job. This has <laughs> been a great little story. I would tell you this, uh, the one thing that I believe for anybody that's listening, right? Um, I believe the power of your mind is everything. Any great, if you really look at study, anybody that's had a very high level of achievement in anything, whether it's business, sports, um, you name it, something happened and something that these people do. And I would consider myself one of these people um, to do it at a level that's pretty, uh, uh, high level mm -hmm. there's a switch that we have i don't think we have we don't have buttons we have switches switches are different mm -hmm. than dials right sure. dials you can turn up and turn down a switch is on or off mm -hmm. and for me the ones that i see that, that really go is they have a switch when they once they decide to make up their minds on mm -hmm. something it is all consuming that's how real estate is for me mm -hmm. it's a switch I'm that passionate about it today as I was when I first started. I love the game. I love what it does. You know, Tom Brady, that was a switch guy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and listen, it's the hardest thing for that guy right now to see and watch it turn, have to turn it off. Absolutely. He doesn't want to turn it off. And so what did he do? He's like, I'm going to become a broad broadcaster yeah. because yeah. I still want, I love it. I love the game of football. That's him, right? Yeah. I find people, when you find your passion, man, that's a switch. And when you will follow your passion, mm -hmm. but it starts with an idea. And listen, right, I believe right. if you believe it, you can achieve it. I love it. I mean, you mentioned a couple uh, of uh, examples in your life, instances where when you talk about switches, you, you know, you said when you went to Hawaii and you saw the example of Bruce, um, you know, maybe you didn't follow it exactly right away how you should have, but, but it was a mental, big mental switch. Like my life what, changed forever. What's possible. You're seeing, Whoa, that's possible. I can create abundance. I can create wealth. And then the second big one was, was, you know, the soccer kind of a, what, what we'll refer to as the low point, but it was sounds like you, you had a major mental switch there as well. And I just love that you took action and, you know, are, are you perfect? No, but I mean, you've put in place a you know you've been very intentional about calendaring you know your life basically and protecting your time and and the, the reason you're doing that is because you've prioritized you know family and relationships um with in, it both inside and outside of your business my over... business works to serve me right to serve my personal vision and that's that's, that's awesome. it that's really good Fantastic. Corey Peterson, this has been very good. I've really enjoyed this episode and I know the listener uh, will as well. Um, where can our listeners reach out to you online? Yeah. So uh, if they listen to podcasts, see, we have a podcast called Multifamily Legacy Podcast or uh, nice. go to our website, kahunainvestments.com. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corey. This has been great. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, brother. And to the listener out there, we also very much appreciate your time, which is your most valuable resource. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care.